but we're, we're going to continue to pay attention to a company's fundamentals because over the long term, that's what counts. I guarantee you that in the long term, GameStop is not going to stay at 300 bucks a share. It ain't going to happen. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required, hosted by LBW. This podcast is intended for free thinkers, entrepreneurs, and knowledge seekers. Join us as we discuss relevant financial topics, explore with guests their financial journeys, and engage with experts in industries such as space, media and entertainment, real estate, and many more. Buckle up and enjoy the ride. All right, (laughs) I want to start us off. You guys ready for this? Y'all ready for this? Space Jam. Okay. Welcome to Critical Thinking Required. You're with your hosts, myself, Tim Bickmore, and my two colleagues, Dan Weiss and Nathaniel Leach. And today we're going to switch up our podcast a little bit and we're going to do an opt ed. And what I mean by that is that we're going to talk about some recent events. And yes, I'm assuming that our listeners and viewers probably know. We're going to talk about GameStop, AMC, Silver. We just want to have an honest conversation about it and at least just give our thoughts from what we've read and and from the past events. So who wants to start and just kind of give a brief update, Nathaniel, please, about what's been going on? Okay. So everybody's been talking about this. If you want to look up the details, there are people far smarter than us who can go into greater depth on what happened. But essentially, social media was harnessed by a number of users on Reddit forums and some other social media discord uh, uh, apps out there to bid up GameStop's price. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that there was their intent was to bid up the price. Their intent was to get a return on their investment because GameStop was the highest shorted stock on the U.S. stock market. And what is especially fascinating was how much it was shorted. It was shorted at one point at over 130% of its shares. So let me break that down. So it had a pro- GameStop has approximately 69 million shares outstanding. 130% of those shares were shorted. So that means that greater than the shares outstanding, that is the number of shares that are out there trading of a company stock, were shorted. So a bunch of investors on these Reddit forums and such got together and said, dude, the number of shares shorted are greater than the amount of shares outstanding. We could get a short squeeze out of this. And if we do this with options, we could get a gamma squeeze out of this. So a bunch of users went and did this. And the intent was that as the price of GameStop stock goes up, those short sellers had to cover their short bets. So what does that mean? A short seller's uh, downside, if the share price goes, uh, goes down, their return is, is capped at zero. If the share price goes up, their losses are unlimited. <laughs> so as GameStop's price started to go up, because those short sellers had committed to buying shares at a lower price, they had to buy back those shares of GameStop that they had lended, been lended of to cover their short sell because otherwise their losses would might have become, in theory, infinite. So what was the downfall to all this? How does this affect GameStop? Well, that's an excellent question, actually. So it's not just GameStop that is affected. I think that there's a lot of second and third order effects that have to be considered. And I don't want to hog all the time here. I mean, if you guys want to step in, but off the top of my head, 
GameStop could take advantage of this situation. And they actually, I, I bet you they have. So in late last year, they did something called a shelf registration, which means that at any time, depending on the document, they would have stated, we reserve the right to issue this many shares uh, at, some, at some point and then whenever we want. They may have taken advantage of this. And the, that's an advantage to them because they're then able to raise capital by issuing out their sh more shares, issuing equity that they can then retain for themselves and reinvest in their business. Now, it's a disadvantage to current investors because it's a dilution of equity, but it's not as bad of a dilution as it would have been at $3 a share versus $300 a share. That's a huge difference. They're not the only company to have done this. AMC Theaters did it uh, more recently. Tesla issued stock twice last year at these crazy high valuations, in our, in our opinion, crazy high valuations. Twice they issued stock and you can't hang it, hold it against them. It was brilliant. They should have done that. That makes sense in terms of capital allocation. That's just one example. Uh, another example is FOMO. We love to talk about fear of missing out, FOMO. Investors are going to see this price go up and then it starts to screw around with your brain because people start to think, oh, I was going to buy GameStop when it was three bucks a share. I should have gotten in. Now people might be thinking, some, some person out there on a Reddit forum, some retail investor might be thinking, oh, I should have gotten in. Well, it's still going through a short squeeze. I, I bet you I could still make some more money. And then they go and buy at a higher price. That's a huge risk because the people that got in early, they're the ones who are going to make out like bandits. The people that come in later to the show, they're the ones that are going to suffer in some way or another. Uh, so based off my understanding, there was also a second order effect to this whole thing where obviously TD Ameritrade, Schwab, Robinhood obviously has been in, in the discussion boards with shutting down the trading um, for the buy side, you could sell, but you couldn't necessarily buy GameStop specifically. And they did this on a couple different other positions that they held within their uh, brokerage. Um, now, my understanding, though, is that because of this high level of shorting, which created this kind of pseudo margin type effect, that it was really actually not good where it was going to start breaking down some of the financial system in the sense of <clears throat> the overall like they just couldn't liquid, like they just didn't have the money to give back to the borrowers. Like you all of a sudden had a liquidity squeeze due to the high volumes of trading. If I am not correct on that, you might correct me there, but that's my understanding of a second order effect where all of a sudden it ripples through the market outside of just GameStop. That, that's an excellent point. Um, this could be the catalyst for some liquidity and solvency issues potentially at some custodian and brokers trading platforms such as, as Robinhood. So what, what Tim is referencing is that Robinhood had to go out and raise, they had to raise capital from not only their credit lines, uh, their established credit lines, but also from their private investors. Uh, initially they had to do uh, 1 billion of capital raise last week, but then they, uh, had to raise, I heard, I heard just recently, they had to raise like an additional 2.4 billion. And there was a reason behind this. It wasn't because they were just being mean and saying to retail investors, we're not going to let you buy anymore because we don't want you to. That's, that's bold. What actually happened was that all trades have to go through the DTCC, I, I, the Depository Trust Corporation. I, it's like a quasi- a government entity, but like private also, all trades have to tr have to clear through this system. So what was happening was that they, it, when a trade settle, when a, when a stock trade settles, it takes two trading days to settle. But because the amount of volume of all these buys and sells was going on with GameStop and on margin, Robinhood, for example, had to, they had to stop the buy orders because they, because the, 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 the DTCC 
was saying that you don't have enough capital on hand to settle these trays in case something goes wrong. Like if you can't collect for those people on who are using margin to make these trades, you don't have enough capital to back it up. That's why they shut down trading for those particular trades. And that's why a number of other custodians who have the capital, but were still dealing with the high volume, couldn't keep up. Yeah, I believe Interactive Brokers was another one that was uh, relatively new on the scene, but not that new. But I have a question that I want to bring up that came up through an article that Nathaniel sent uh, Tim, and, Tim and myself, the rest of our team this morning. And then I'd really like to touch on some of the narrative because Tim and I have discussed this topic with clients multiple times every day. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't want those conversations. Those are fine. But the narratives are concerning. I think we should talk about it. Before we get there, just because I think it, it ropes in really well with the dialogue we've had so, so far about the behind the scenes, the article that I am talking about addresses that there isn't a question here. The businesses we're talking about, they are struggling businesses. That's why professional money managers are shorting them because they expect these businesses to do poorly and for their prices to continue to fall. Okay? That's not in debate. <laughs> so... The question, going back to Tim's question, Nathaniel, on a different angle is, yes, places like GameStop, AMC could take advantage in some ways. And then also, these are also businesses in the last couple of years that have been looking for potential buyers. So with the increase in the price of their stock, I think that there are people, which will come back to the narrative, that are trying to jump on this bandwagon because they think they are supporting these entities. But in all reality, these entities looking for buyers, Thania, what does that result possible look like? GameStop can't sell itself at 300 bucks a share. That's so, the problem. So if GameStop Why is, is that, Thanny? Why is that? No, no, no. Let Dan go. Let Dan go. Because I think if GameStop is struggling selling at $3 a share, and like Nathaniel said, now they have to try to sell at 300 the likelihood of them selling that business, it's not good. So if we're concerned about employees or getting value out of it, that's gone. Those people are done, right? Because you're closing, you're not selling and onboarding those assets and those employees and so on elsewhere. It's just over. And, and I think you bring up a solid point and it's a, it's an interesting one. And I think what, what I struggle with the GameStop and from a narrative perspective is that people want to put it in a black and white box. And I just don't think it's black and white. I think it is gray, like the majority of life. I would say all of life is gray. And where it's almost like this Occupy Wall Street. I've seen that where we're occupying Wall Street, but through a way that actually hurts the man. I was like, what man are you really hurting? And like, don't get me wrong. Do I think that there's hedge funds and there's some bad people out there that want to do some negative things where there's a group of hedge funds that are going to negatively promote certain information about a company or you know go about it? Sure, there's just bad people in the world. Like, that's just a fact. Now, on the other side, do I think that the group of people that are also promote, promoting and trying to take it down, it's the same. You're making the same action. You're, you're fighting fire with fire in all reality. And, and at the same time, the second and third order effects of the potential is it, it could really ripple through and, and hurt a lot of people. Now, I'm not saying that I'm for the institution and, and not saying like, hey, there should be changes, there should be fixes to the institution. The institution is there. But the hard part is that institution is a lot more sticky than I think most people give it credit for. And I, and I also think that the burning down it to the ground, it, it can cause a lot more issues to the people that actually were burning it than they sometimes recognize. And unfortunately, that is the world that we currently live in. Like, for example, having margin trading, like maybe that should be like maybe it's showing some weaknesses. And I think there's been other weaknesses shown in 2008 that we should start going after from a regulatory standpoint of being like, hey, how can you actually have derivatives that cause this kind of problem? For example, what Nathaniel was talking about with the gamma squeeze or the short squeeze and having more shorts than there are actively open shares. I mean, that just doesn't make sense to me. So, but it's, it's again, it's gray. And I think you're, it's, it's a zero. It, I think in, I don't remember which, which movie it is, but uh uh, what's the movie? The Wall Street. Is it Wall Street? Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Gordon Gecko. Oh, Wall Street. Yeah. And he talks about mm -hmm. it. It's, it's a zero sum game. Someone's going to lose. It's just who do you want to lose? And that person, people who are losing might actually then get affected as well. Like, 
it's just it's more dynamic and more intricate in my mind but it, it paints up tim's picture for example right so in talking to people we've been getting a lot of well just want to fight back on people betting on businesses failing that's sad um it is sad that businesses fail they do though um and we've been getting comments like you know, these, these billionaire hedge fund managers are making a ton of money on, on the demise of these kind of concepts. It's true. That's true. But like Tim's saying, here's what you have to understand. A couple things here. For one, that hedge fund manager, if they're doing their job correctly, most of them probably not making one solo bet that happens to be a hedge on that company. That's unlikely, right? Meaning that if it does go kaplunk, Will they lose a ton of money? Yes. Will they still have a ton more? Yes, they will. So will it affect their quality of life? Probably not. Probably not. So, but who it will affect though is the fact that those same managers are involved in state pension plans that perhaps our local teachers are uh, participating in. Perhaps they're involved with funds that make up your 401k. You may be hurting yourself. So at the end of the day, and this is sad that this is the way the world works, but it is, the, the little guy gets hurt because they're not able to be insulated like the big guy. And so someone is getting hurt. It's probably not the person that you're intending to hurt. And somebody is definitely walking away with a total win. Who's walking away with a total win? Well, the person that convinced the influence to be able to go ahead and make these, these rounds, right? So Mr. Gill, the former employee from Mass Mutual, um, that is a credit is given credit to pushing a lot of this concept on Reddit. The first day made twenty million dollars. Benefited. A lot of other people didn't. And like and like has been mentioned before too, the person that gets hurt is the person who ends up holding the bag in the end and is bought at a higher price because, as we stated, these entities are not growing on the merits of these entities. They're growing because simply others are throwing money at them. And when that stops, which eventually happens, what happens? And to, to reiterate, they're, the company's not growing. it. It's the stock price that is growing. Yeah. The, the price is totally distinctive from value. And, and I'd also like to make an, uh, Dan makes some excellent points here. I would like to approach it though from another perspective in the sense that short sellers do play a, a role in capital markets. In, in capitalism in general, they bring about uh, the deaths of companies in some cases. And in most situations, it's warranted because those companies are dying. That's what makes capitalism so great in my mind that it's, it's like a, a forest fire. A forest fire clears out the dead wood, clears out the dead, the dead weed, all that crap. It's the same thing that short sellers do. Companies die and it's natural. It's okay. It's normal. Yes. The little person, the little guy does suffer. They lose their job. But what makes our economy, the U S economy so great is the dynamic, the dynamicism. That is that there's typically a job for that person available. They just have to go out and find it. Now I'm, I'm not saying that this is the case for everybody. I know it's not. But I think that our, our country has, um, has built a, a corporate, uh, not a corporate, a legal system and, and, a, and a business system that allows for people to go bankrupt and, very, and, and rel get relatively easily back up on their feet. If you compare us to other countries around the world, we are one of the few out there that ha of how e relatively easy it is to get, get back up on your feet after bankruptcy or a tough run because of how easy it is to start a business, how little red tape you have to go through. And that's what makes this country so great is that we're able to be so dynamic. There is a part to play for short sellers, long-term investors, and it's all in the name of that capitalism game and it's healthy. It's okay, but there's going to be good and bad along with it. Like anything else. That's a, it's a actually a really interesting, it's a different take on that lens, which 
I appreciate that, that insight. And I, I'm going to question you back on that, Thanny, in the sense of kind of coming at it like this. So in the sense of capitalism, you have these bigger institutions, these bigger players that may have different information than the general public that are willing to put some bets behind these shorts. And now what we've seen is the power of the general public coming back and, and fighting against that, that trade, right? And, and they were very successful in that, right? So how do you feel about that power dynamic shift in the sense of, in the name of capitalism, where you can all of a sudden have social media gather multiple people, which means you can put enough demand behind a certain play to start driving those prices. And we wouldn't have been able to do this 10 years ago. You know, 2000, I mean, if you went back to 2009, I mean, think about where technology is and social media. It's like, what are your overall thoughts from the standpoint of social media providing a space for the general public in addition to fees being reduced at significant rates down to zero, aka Robinhood, to allow easy access to the capital markets in this way, then having social media be the place where they can group together in an instant to then push a trade, which capitalism essentially created that ability for the general Mm -hmm. public to do. I I think that it's normal. It's evolution. And I see nothing wrong with it. Now, if it, there hasn't been any any evidence of this in the GameStop example, but if, for example, there had been false information, misleading information that had been conveyed back and forth on social media, that's regulated already. That's a red flag that there could be some regulatory action, but that didn't happen with this. Yeah. What happened was it was a short squeeze game at the highest shortest squeezed short the, the highest shorted uh, company on the U.S. stock market. So you get enough buyers on that train, there's bound to be a reaction in the opposite direction, which was what happened. That doesn't mean that this sort of thing is going to repeat in exactly the same way it just happened. It's going to to shift. It's going to change. It's going to evolve. Silver is an example. We'll see what happens with this. But there's different, there's different factors at play. Silver is not equal to GameStop stock. It's a commodity. It's different. Yeah. But social media as, as a tool for change, we've seen it's both good and bad. This could be good and bad as well. Uh, I think that it would be a mistake to underestimate the power of social media to be able to aggregate so many people uh, to then convey change. We already seen examples of this worldwide over the past decade. Again, both good and bad. I don't see anything wrong with it. I don't think though that it changes uh, for us as quote value investors. And we are really just investors, long-term investors. It doesn't change the, the, the game for us. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're going to start looking at companies differently. We don't short, we're never going to short. This is one example of why, uh, but we're, we're going to continue to pay attention to a company's fundamentals because over the long term, that's what counts. I guarantee you that in the long term, GameStop is not going to stay at three hundred bucks a share. It ain't going to happen. And there's multiple reasons for that. It's not that I'm just saying that because rats we didn't get in it when we had the chance. I'm saying that because do, simply due to some core factors. For example. This is not the first time that something like this has happened. I can rattle off a number of examples. Dot com era, the nifty 50 is in, in the nifty 50 stocks in the 60s and 70s, the 1920s, right before the depression hit, uh, the South Sea Company, the Dutch tulip me- mania. This was legitimate. Have you, have you all heard about the Dutch tulip mania? That's a fun one. It, the, and the Dutch decided that tulip bulbs, flowers, were exceedingly rare and they bit up the price of this. What and do you think certain diseases, I believe, in that flower, if I'm not correct. I, I don't know about that. That had like I'll take your certain, for it. certain cuts of color in it. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I thought you said diseases. Yes. Yeah, that's, it was like a fungus of... or something that created. Okay. The... Yeah. Yes, that is accurate. Different types of colors were received yeah. different types of values. And then what happened? Well, so. 
And that's, and that's my thing is if, if you look at that, obviously this has happened, but what's interesting, I think I honestly, maybe Dan, this is a question for you, but what's feels just different. And it could be obviously my age and just being in the market, you know, in the, the era, the era of technology, but the quickness at which this gets spread has to be exponential relative to those past histories. Nifty 50, there's no way the information could spread at the, at the pace and the quickness as it is today. I mean, GameStop happened and I was getting people asking me questions about it, like not even an hour later, like what's going on with GameStop? So like the speed at which information can be transferred is just to me in like, it's just eerie. Like, it's just like how quick and fast and widespread it can be, can get, which then if you then couple that again, going back to technology where before, let's say we go back to the nineties, you couldn't get in to positions that easily. You technically probably needed still a broker to a degree. There are still online platforms, but today there's a like Robin hood literally tells you to invite your friend to give them free stock. Like that's how low cost it's become to enter into the market, which means that a subset of people that weren't able to get in are now there, which then, and then you mix that with social media. To me, it's just like, wait a sec. That's a different marketplace relative to the nifty 50 era. Yeah. Uh, the, the speed of information has drastically increased, but so then what does that mean? That means that most likely the, the buildup to this was really quick, right? In comparison to all these past other manias. What do you think that means for the going out part? Hard. I'm not fast. saying it's going to immediately crash. I'm not saying that. It may continue on for years. But this concept, it's a tool. Social media is a tool. Short selling is a tool. It's all about how you use them and then how quickly you get bored of them. In this particular example, we have to also consider other factors. It all it boils down to supply and demand. Are there going to be enough sellers to continue to raise this price? At some point, nobody's going to want to want to sell anymore because the price is so high. But then eventually, somebody's going to pull their finger, and the dam's going to break. The price will eventually start to go down because people are going to want to start to sell and take their profits. It's guaranteed. Other things with regards to where we are right now, the pandemic, not as, some people aren't working. So what are they doing? Day trading. Some people don't have sports to bet on anymore. So what are they doing? They're gambling. Where are they gambling? Day trading. Uh, it's even a worse casino because I think at least inside of the casino setting, you have a, have a pretty good idea as to what your odds are and you don't hear. So... <laughs> It, you know, and bad, bad decisions, I feel, are fostered when they're applied to a rapid and short time frame. And um, that's what's, I think, happening more so to Tim's point about us seeing this in the information age is because you combine that with the fear of missing out and you have to react before you can really honestly think about it and you make bad decisions. And I think that's perhaps the fact that we haven't seen to the same extent with some of these other crises that we've seen before. In fact, crisis, I think, is the word because although our, the way we try to invest on a merit-based fundamental concept doesn't change, I honestly am very, very concerned and worried and scared about the, you can bleep this out later if you like, but the mind that this does to people. Because it is, I see this as taking the market, which some people may argue it was already this way, and whatever it is, but weaponizing it. And the problem is that what do you do when you apply? You might own a great company, but it goes haywire because it is, again, and I believe this, being manipulated by some form to go in a direction that has nothing to do with the credibility of that entity at the price it should be trading at. And if that happens, of course, yes, Nathaniel was right. It, it will eventually stop. But in that meantime, which can be a while, what kind of havoc does that basically place on people's lives and so on? And how much of that 
is really going to be able to give the game back. Well, if I may then, Dan, I, this is to my point about why we don't short. You're right. If we were shorting, this would be, I would be scared. I'd be scared shitless right now. But that's not the case for us. But, but Dan brings up an excellent point that for anybody who is shorting using margin. So when you use margin, that doesn't mean that you're just shorting. You can also be buying long, but you're buying long with borrowed money. And every custodian or broker has their margin requirement that if it drops below that, then you're, they're going to sell your stuff without asking you to maintain that margin requirement. So you, you have to consider that, that leverage is, is huge. <laughs> it's funny because we see this all the time, long and short, when someone says, when you're looking at two avenues and they are looking to achieve the same thing at the same price and the same conditions, and then one says, yeah, but we could do it three times more so, uh, let me tell you how they do it. <laughs> That's that is, oh man, no, leverage is, I, well, works the opposite and, way. And, and the, mm. the thing too, I think what gets me so, I'll be very honest, I think what gets me heated about this, and again, I don't know what side I'm on, on when it comes to, you know, Wall Street, going to Main Street, you know, that, that whole narrative. I, I'm going to take the narrative of a financial advisor, of somebody that actually works with the general public and who works with people who try to invest their money and are looking to invest their money. And where I struggle with some of the social media rhetoric and with some of these posts and different things and with people who have are well known um, in the business world in investing in the VC and talking about how much money they potentially made within this trade. And they talk about it in the sense of, Hey, I put in a hundred thousand dollars and I made X amount. I really, really struggle with it. Like I struggle with it to the point where it's like, it's almost like extremely frustrated because I can get behind the idea. And I know this is going to be the answer. Well, everyone can just make their own decisions. If they don't want to do it, that's their choice. If they want to leverage their house, it's their choice, right? Well, then that same conclusion got those Wall Street guys that you're trying to defeat there. That's not my fault. I'm short in the stock. I'm screwing the little guy. I don't care, right? That That's the same concept. And what I struggle with is that when you go ahead and do it, what's not being seen is like Dan mentioned, is how much of your capital is really being at risk, right? With these people that have a lot of money, and let's say they throw a hundred grand into this play, and they make X amount, that was probably such a sliver of what they actually have. And then people watch that regardless if they want, you know, if they know that or not, or think about it like that, they go ahead and then they'll take their actual hundred grand. That's all they have throw it into this kind of a concept and lose it all. And they'll go into bankruptcy and they're never coming back. Like the risk of capital is such a big deal. And that's where it makes me frustrated to the general public is I think there is a concept which is like, it's a moral hazard because people don't grasp it. And I don't, it's, and it's, it's on, you know, like the United States has to have better education around finance, better education around what this is actually doing. Because I don't think if you're in a position like that to start spouting off about this only drives the fire and will drive those people directly to the fire and they're going to stay in the fire and you're not. And like, again, you can make the argument, well, they're going to do them. It's they have to educate themselves. But at what point is that is that a responsibility of someone to say, hey, 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 I did this because, again, it was 0.1% of what I can invest. If I would have lost it, it was like you losing a dollar. It's like you losing a dollar. But if you put a dollar into this concept, you're going to make five. Right? It's like, like cryptocurrency investing. It's, it's just, and that's, what's frustrating about it is like, this isn't a joke and people will risk a lot of capital into concepts like this, that they don't have the capacity to do it and they watch it. And like, even the, the trader, whoever started it, you know what I mean? Like some of these traders on this Reddit forum, based off what I've read are not just random Joes, they're professional traders and they've used social media to their advantage. Good for them. That's exactly what they can, but like recognize the game you're playing. And we talk about that a lot and it's, it can be very dangerous for a lot of the people that might be playing the game. It really makes me angry too, for the same reasons. Yeah. It's it's frustrating as all hell. Talk about the time. I mean, it's, I I think anybody who takes onto a public forum has chosen to do so 
my personal opinion is that means that they should accept the responsibility that they're in a position to influence others and that others are easily influenced. And whether or not that is on them or not, that's the reality of things. Very, very similar to we have elected to be held to a certain standard because of the license that we carry within our industry. We have a responsibility then to put people's interests ahead of our own. And we chose that responsibility because it's the right thing to do. And we tied our feet to that rock. It drives. And this is also a hot topic, I think, too, because there are other conversations like the cryptocurrency conversation, like cannabis now, actually, a couple of years ago, but we'll see it again, um, that come up about this concept of decentralization and independence. And um, I don't have a problem with that idea. Really, I don't. Um, but I have a problem with the reality of that idea of being masked. Decentralization sounds great, but there's always somebody that's going to try to rise to power in those hands, they shift. So when you're trying to knock a person off their high horse, that's just the reality of the world. There's someone else that would jump back right on. So when we talk about the Occupy Wall Street concept, well, I think it's, I, you know, I worry about pushing one person off to get somebody else on. And you're basically in the same situation. Anybody that's seen Star Wars or Hunger Games, you know what I'm talking about. I, I have a, a slightly, um, I, I disagree with you guys to a certain extent. Tim, I strongly agree with what you're saying about education. Strongly agree. But unfortunately, I think that that's like a fund. I think our educational system is fundamentally broken in a sense, not just with regards to financial education, but just in general. I think it needs to be rebuilt from the ground up, unfortunately. But however, I do disagree with you both in the sense that, Dan, I agree with you. If you go on a social media platform and you start to spout off about something, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this, because it's a short squeeze, a potential short squeeze. I totally agree that, hey, full disclosure, I own, I own some of this stock. I, I, that is completely legitimate. I completely agree with that. What I don't agree with, though, is that I think that information today is very widely available, that people can educate themselves from, from the internet, for example. And I think that there, to, what I struggle with is like, is the ebb and flow of who, where, where is the line of responsibility here? between a person knowing and understanding what they're getting involved in and then the government and the regulators and legislative body who are trying to control this risk. I really struggle with that. Like where does the line go? It's kind of like totally different topic, but similar. The idea of universal income. My definition of the bare minimum is going to be completely different to yours and Dan's definition of what you need to get by. That's what I really struggle with is that it's the same concept applies here. What is your debt? Now, even with our educational system, let's say if everybody's educated the same, even then it boils down to what were you taught by your parents? Maybe you didn't grow up with a two parent parent household, like uh, maybe you only had one parent and that one parent was working three jobs to support you. Like they don't have the time to, to teach you a lot of this stuff because they're trying to, to make enough money to just support you. Like there's so many other factors involved. Everybody's different. So where I'm not saying I know where the line is drawn, but yeah. where, sh how, how do we get there? I mean, uh... The comment that I'd make on that, and I mean, I'm glad you bring up the, the, the aggregate, right? That's the opposing side to the argument. And I'll be upfront about my bias. I think I get frustrated just because I know what's behind the sheets of a decent amount of people. And I know how people are making decisions and I know what people are looking at. And I see the FOMO and I see the behavioral biases on a consistent basis that make people make inopportune decisions about their finances. And I can tell you that before really getting into this type of work, that you could read about biases, you could maybe try to understand about yourself. But when you start watching it on a scale of multiple households, multiple people, 
it's very apparent and very, very real that sometimes these, these decision-making isn't necessarily due to not doing your own research. So to give you a really good example, scarcity, scarcity is a real thing. And guess what? The majority of the United States is probably in a scarce position, both from a monetary perspective, as well as a time perspective. So when you're in a scarce position, it has been studied that you start making inopportune decisions. So if I know that I'm really, really nervous about trying to get my bills paid and I just watch someone make X amount of dollars, I may go right ahead and just try to bet my luck, right? And I'm going to go for it because I'm in a position that I'm not really thinking straight. I might not really understand the position. I may not even have the time to research what's really going on. All I see is that that someone's making money and I'm not. And I think that being in that position is very, very difficult. And people who are making those decisions and are making that money aren't really necessarily in a mindset or not necessarily mindset, but where they are financially in a different position. So what I'm saying is if we really want to play this game, let's let's unveil the covers. Let's start telling, hey, this is what my net worth is. This is how much I have. This is what it means to me because everyone's making these financial decisions and watching everyone else, but they only see the tip of the iceberg. They only see what they see based off of social media or anything else. So like, that's where all of a sudden I start struggling is that if, for example, and I probably, I'm not very active on social media from the standpoint of like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Here's my life. But if I were to make a bet like this, I would go ahead and say, this is 0.1% of my overall net worth. So now number one, you know how much I am worth fine. Come after me, I guess, if you want to and come steal my stuff Two, now you understand the risk that I'm actually putting towards this position. And then that's providing education to the person that's like, wait a second, that's really a small percentage. If I compared it to like, I have this much. And if you had this much, this is how much it would be equate to you. Now go ahead and try to make that decision. You could educate those people who are not educating themselves just by revealing the the full information about the position you're making. So at what point do you start saying like, what's right or wrong? Now you could say, well, it's my privacy. I don't want to do that. Then I just don't think you should promote it onto social media. And just don't do it. Our system is not going to always be a hundred percent, but what we can do is, is we can try and get as close to that as possible. And I, I think that we should, but I, I don't, I think that there's a lot of other parties involved that would all have to come together and, and make, make stuff happen. What's interesting about some of these, I'll go back to 2008, right? 2008 was detrimental for so many people across the United States, across the world. And, but what it did is it made the regulations on banks tighter. It made them have higher capital requirements. There's just different things that came out of that event. And I think that is one thing that you can take from events like this is it makes, it forces a lens on the the system and said, where is the system breaking and where can it, you know, come together? Right. And I think that that is one one part that I am optimistic about is that hopefully if there and I'm not saying, you know, if, if there was issues or if there was something going on with the, the idea of social media is that our policies and our regulations can catch up with the times because technology technology is advancing just at a, a hyper speed relative to policy change. And actually, I wanted to mention something that Nathaniel actually um, more so turned my eyes was years ago when I had a child, um, you know, come into this world four years ago, Nathaniel started sending me articles. Uh, hold on, this will make sense in a second. Articles, because he was worried about my daughter, because he's Uncle Fanny and, and, you know, and so on. And so he started sending me articles about horrible things that social media um, is doing, influencing young kids and so on. So that I was prepared and educated. On, on things to, to keep, you know, Leor out away from this, which I greatly appreciate. Um, this is why we love and, Uncle Fanny, just throwing that out yeah. there. <laughs> and, you know, and, and I send I'm you sorry. stuff that is none of my business sending. <laughs> no, no, it <laughs> is what I do. I'm glad you do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think I maybe thought about this beforehand, but I don't have a, I don't recall that I did, but I definitely started thinking about it then. I very much worry about social media. And, uh, you know, I have, we have a lot of clients that work in social media. I use several different platforms myself, but looking looking into the future and then looking back, I just worry that we're going to see a lot more negative things come out of social media than positive. 
things. And here we're talking about a number of events, manipulations, whatever you call influences coming off of social media. And it really, um, it really worries me because at the end of the day, social media is a form of reality TV. And it's not all real because reality TV is not about being real. So my final thoughts on this podcast, which I'm going to reemphasize that this is just an opinion and on what's going on. And, and we talked about a lot of different uh, uh, ideas and thoughts. And I, and I want to emphasize my where I'm coming from, from a lens perspective, because I think people probably should do that more often is Nathaniel said very well, life is gray. And typically you're using a certain lens to evaluate a problem. And there's multiple lenses that can be applied to one problem. And you'll probably see different solutions or different breaks. And my lens comes from working with a lot of people and from a financial perspective. And I think that it creates a bias. It creates a bias that I get frustrated watching others promote it and joke about it where I've seen what it can do to somebody if they decide to get involved in it because they just don't quite understand it or they don't have the means to necessarily do it. And um, I think that creates a lens for me that is not always looking at every angle. And that's why I appreciate the two of you because Nathaniel, you bring up really, really, really good points um, about capitalism. You bring up good points about shorting. Um, And I think that you always have to take a step back and look at it from all angles to see exactly what's going on and and assimilate that information. So my final thought is that you, any of my thoughts were coming from that angle and that position just due to the work that we do. Um, And so overall, I just wanted to clear that space. I think that social media as an engine, as a tool can and will continue to be utilized in the fashion that we have recently seen, but it is one additional factor to the machine that is that will continue to run off of basic principles, which simply is in the long run, the markets are a weighing machine. In the short term, they are a voting machine, to paraphrase Ben Graham. The fundamentals will always win out in the end. You just have to have a long enough investment time frame to see that come to its fulfillment. I think also that it comes down to supply and demand. Eventually it will be impossible to buy, for example, GameStop at a price that somebody is willing to sell it at because somebody will want to, they'll want a higher price, higher price, higher price. It'll bid up, bid up, bid up, bid up. But then eventually someone is going to say, I want to sell. And then it may start to snowball. When that happens, we don't know. But we're not going to, for us, risk our clients' money on a bet like that for uh, FOMO purposes. We're not going to be the fool holding the bag when that happens because it's just not worth the risk. You, You have to be rational about what you're doing with your money. You have to look at it as Tim described it, how much is this as a percentage of what I can truly spend, invest versus my net worth, investable assets, whatever be the case. And be honest with yourself. If you really can't afford that, then you shouldn't be doing it. And that's all right. Don't do it. So with that, we want to thank you for listening to three guys talking about what they love. And we wish you a good night. Thank you for taking the time to start your journey of thinking differently and listening to LBW talk about stuff they love. Until next time.